So, uh, yeah, good to have you here. Let's thank the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather again in person as your family. Lord, we know that you're always with us, that your spirit indwells us, that we don't stop being family. But Lord, it's sure nice. It's sure nice to get together with family. We thank you for that. We thank you for your give, your forgiveness that makes us family. And we want to praise you this morning. In your name, amen. I guess I should plug in. this morning uh, I just uh, one is kind of obvious we're back to one service with no restrictions there was a little good confusion early in the week because they hadn't really released um, the the um, they hadn't really released the information on church services uh, early in the week but when they did release it it uh, was just two simple lines it said there are no restrictions on religious gatherings both indoors and outdoors so woohoo, right? It's good to be here. So I want to just remind everybody that COVID's still out there. You know, there's still, you know, there's still people catching it. It's um, so so masks in a lot of cases are recommended. So don't uh, don't let anybody disc you if you decide to wear your mask. All right, but uh, yeah, it's uh, we just still need to look after each other and keep each other safe. So. It's not, they're just not mandatory. So, um, yeah, Pastor Ted's going to pray a little bit better, or a little, little, maybe a little bit better, <laughs> but a little bit later as well about uh, some of the situations going on, people's health and the fire situation. But we need to remember the folks that are being affected by the fires. We can all relate. Remember when we got evacuated? Well, Deca Lake area and a lot of that country out there has been evacuated. There's people coming into 100 Mile. They're concerned about overflow. We have offered our church to help with processing evacuees and that sort of thing. 
So you may see some uh, different faces around here over the next week or so. Uh, I'm not sure if they're going to take us up on that. They asked us if our church would be available, and we have let them know that it will be for sure. Uh, also, we've been using the church as a cooling center. I don't know how many of you are aware of that, but some of you have been volunteering to come down here and spend time, open up the building so the people that need to can get out of the heat and uh, find a cool place to go. And that's, that's uh, when you're living on the street or living in your van or something like that, that is incredibly important. It's such a blessing to just have a place to go and cool off and get some water. So keep the folks um, in prayer that uh, are fighting with the weather. Keep the folks in prayer that are fighting with the fire. Think of the families in Lytton that lost their homes. Um, you know, we know we know those possibilities. That could have been us in 2017. And uh, just keep these people in prayer, all right? Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for our extended community throughout the province. Lord, we know that you're a gracious God. You're a compassionate God. And you care for us. You care for all people. And Lord, we just pray that your hand would be on these situations. That we pray that people would be turning to you in there. There are times of, of fear and concern and frustration. And Lord, we pray that as your people, we would find ways, we'd actively look for ways to support people, to help people that are going through these tough times. In your name, amen. So. This is a song that we've introduced, since most of you are sitting in the seats here. But you, hopefully you've heard it over the live stream and that sort of thing. It talks about the goodness of God. Oh man, I've got the wrong music up here. The wrong key, sorry. So, here we go.
All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness. Of your voice, you have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, I have been in the goodness. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing. Your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord. His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship your holy name You're rich in love And you're so true your name is great, and your heart is kind for all. 
Gospels, it tells us that the truth will set you free. And uh, talks about Jesus bringing that message of truth and that freedom to us. The truth will set you free.
Thank you. It sounds great in here with a bunch of people singing. So. Thank you very much to the worship team. Another great job. And uh, wow, is it sure uh, fantastic to be back together again, isn't it? Free at last. <laughs> we just sang that, didn't we? Anyhow, that's great, and uh, I think it's almost been a year and a half, uh, pushing it anyhow, since we've been free to come together as we are, and that's uh, what a wonderful blessing it is, and we're praying that it'll remain that way, right? And uh, that's our prayer for that. I uh, also want to mention, uh, yesterday we had a uh, memorial service here uh, for Ken Burns, for those who don't know, he realized that he passed away just immediate family for the most part but there's a few uh, there's a few desserts left over in boxes I think in the kitchen there uh, there might be a few uh, if, if anyone is interested in taking them feel free to take that um, <clears throat> so yeah we want to remember uh, those who are st- struggling with sickness and and challenges many people uh, connected to our congregation in that situation and uh, you know we just want to you know most of you know who they are in that situation and we just want to remember them in prayer you know every time because it's a challenge. And of course the fires and wasn't that an incredible um, shock and tragedy what happened to Lytton. Uh, totally unexpected, eh? Just boom. And uh, you know, it's just so many people that lost their homes and uh, <clears throat> I guess we're not sure exactly uh, how many might have lost their lives yet. But uh, it's, uh, we need to pray for that situation, the whole situation that God would um, be merciful to us in this area that these fires might get away again because it brings back memories, doesn't it? And they're not good memories uh, for most of us, for sure. So let's go to prayer as we, uh, before we get into the message, if we can. Father, we want to thank you for, again for the opportunity to be uh, back together in freedom <clears throat> um, with no restrictions. And uh, we want to be mindful that, uh, yes, that uh, COVID is still out there and, and to be um, mindful of that for other people who may be uh, sensitive to that. Uh, situation, uh, but nonetheless, Lord, we want to thank you for uh, the, um, the this the chance to get together again and, and just fellowship, just say hi, how you doing, and uh, in one in one big family, it's such a such a release and, uh, and a relief, Lord, and it just reminds us of how much we miss fellowship, and how important it is, and that's certainly you taught us many lessons, and that's one of them, I'm sure, Lord, and we want to thank you for the fellowship we have in the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord it's it's a real blessing father and Lord we want to remember those uh, who were affected by the fires uh, and uh, just think of uh, Lytton right now and the, the, that uh, the people that are just totally displaced and just lost everything 
and what a shock and who knows if there's a loss of lives in that situation Lord but we we just want to bring those people before you and uh, pray for your sense of uh, comfort and, and restoration to them in these coming days, weeks, months, years. And uh, Lord, uh, we just want to pray for our own situation uh, in, in terms of the fires, uh, not only in, in BC, but around the world, who knows. Uh, Father God, that you'd be merciful to us in this area. And uh, we just give that to you, Father. And Lord, for those in our midst that are struggling with sickness, <clears throat> who are grieving because of loss, uh, Father God, you know who they are, and, and most of us know who they are, and we just pray that uh, your spirit of, of love and encouragement would be upon them right now, and the spirit of healing. Jesus, you can you can heal if you choose to, and we know that sometimes you choose to do it, and sometimes you, you choose not to. But we leave that in your hands, Lord, and pray for the spirit of healing through Jesus upon these people. So, Lord, we want to pray for your hand upon the message today and that uh, you would speak to our hearts and um, open up the word of truth. And no one is able to proclaim the word perfectly. I'm, I'm certainly not going to say everything is 100% correct, that's for sure. But nonetheless, the Holy Spirit can take what is in the word and apply it to hearts to bring freedom to our lives. And we pray that that would happen now. And we ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> the message uh, today is called... Uh, First of all, and it's based on 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 6. And um, yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just read that if I could right now for you. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good. And pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. In this letter of 1 Timothy, uh, Paul is writing to a young pastor called Timothy. And Tim <clears throat> Timothy is having some big problems. Uh, the church he was pastoring was not in good shape. Uh, some people in the church were teaching false doctrines. And they were twisting the truth of God's word. Other people were going off on tangents and devoting themselves to irrelevant things like myths and genealogies. And Paul said these things were just meaningless speculations that were creating controversies and divisions. So he says in 1 Timothy 1, 3-4, Command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations. It's easy. It's easy, really, to get caught up with issues and things that are not central to the purpose of God. It's, it's just easy for all of us and missing the main goal of the Christian life. And just what is the central purpose and goal of the Christian life? Well, uh, let me summarize what I think it is in a phrase, and then we'll look at the scripture. The central goal in the Christian life is loving people from the heart because we have faith in God. Let's read those scriptures again in 1 Timothy 1, 3-6. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal, the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a sincere faith. Some indeed have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. You know, God's work is done by faith. It is faith in God that ignites the love of God in our hearts. And Paul says the goal is love that comes from faith. Now I can remember uh, in my late teens that I started, uh, you know, I was in the church as a, as a Christian and what have you, and I started um, reading uh, certain literature about uh, theories uh, of the things in the Bible. I mean, even it's funny things, you know, outside, funny uh, outside things that don't really mean much. And I had lots of verses put together and what have you. 
I would speculate about things like, uh, oh, I wonder where the lost ten tribes of Israel are. <laughs> like, who cares? But it was meaningful to me at the time. Or, uh, when is the second coming of Christ going to occur, and what exactly is going to happen before it occurs? Pure speculation. And it didn't turn out the way I thought it would anyhow. And things like this became a main focus for me, not just peripheral, but a main focus for me. But they did not increase my faith in God and my love for others. Instead, it just caused dissension. And that's the kind of thing Paul was warning against. He said the goal of the Christian life is not controversial speculations or arguing, arguing over things that really don't matter. What matters is love from the heart that comes from a sincere faith in God. If faith in God resulting in love for others is the central goal of the Christian life, then that kind of theme should be found you know, in most of the New Testament letters. It should be found all over the place, right? If that's the central theme. And the theme of faith resulting in love should, uh, should be found everywhere. And Paul wrote 13 letters in the New Testament, and sure enough, the, that concept, in one way or another, is found in just about every one of them. Now, here are uh, just a few examples. Galatians 5, 6. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Here's another example. Ephesians 1, 15 to 16. For this reason, ever since I've heard about you, your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Here's another one. Colossians 1, 3-4. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard about your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. And then finally, I'll, this last one, there's other ones, but I'll just give you four. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and consequently, the love all of you have for one another is increasing. The more faith we have in God, the more love we will have for others. But here is an important question. What specifically is it that we are to believe about God that will enable us to love others? For example, um, I can believe in God, right? But also believe that he's very hard to please and that he's always upset at me when I make a mistake. Will that kind of faith in God increase my love for others? No. Just the opposite. And John says this in 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. John says if we fear God, you know, fear God in that sense, we will not be made perfect in love. Because fear of God has to do with you know, punishing us for our mistakes. No, John tells us that we, um, we experience love not by trying to appease the anger of God. Instead, we experience love when we believe that God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for our sins. When we really didn't care, couldn't care less about God, he did it anyhow. Instead of punishing us then, he lovingly lays down his life for us. He took our punishment. And this is what he says in the same chapter in, in 1 John 4. He says this, This is love. Not that we love God. No, no. But he loved us. He loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us this way, right? He loved us when we didn't love him. We also ought to love one another this way. Loving others when they don't love us, right? Also, we know and rely on the love God has for us. That's present tense, even today. We're supposed to be relying on the love that God is pouring out on us. The love that is gracious love. Like, I don't deserve it, right? God is love. We love because he first loved us. 
not because we first loved him. Paul says, uh, God loved us when we didn't love him. And even today, we know and rely know and rely on the same kind of love that God has for us, present tense. God still loves us today in that same way. He loved me that like that when I became a Christian. He still loves me in the same way today. It's not that he loved me that way before I was a Christian, but now, now no, I've got to earn his love, right? We must constantly know, believe, and rely on the love God has for us in our imperfection when we do not love him. I have personally, just my own feeling, <laughs> I have personally given up trying to impress and love God so that he will love me more. I have found that God's love and acceptance cannot be earned. It can only be accepted with praise and gratitude. And I have found <clears throat> the more I believe God loves me in my brokenness, and I'm pretty broken, you're probably, probably obvious, <laughs> but he loves me in my brokenness when I don't love him even sometimes. Because my heart goes all over the place sometimes. My head goes like... <laughs> The more I'm able to, and the more I, I realize that, and the more I believe that he loves me just in the way I am, the more I am able to love him. And I'm able to love you in your brokenness, even if you don't love me. That's supernatural love, isn't it? The fact that God loved me when I don't love him automatically unleashes my love for him. And I begin to live in more praise and gratitude for his gracious undeserved love towards me and that that softens my heart towards God and towards you faith in the grace of God releases the love of God okay so <clears throat> in chapter 2 Paul tells Timothy that there are some practical things you know we can do to increase our faith in God's uh, love for us and our love for others and he summarizes it this way. First of all, <clears throat> pray with gratitude for everyone. Paul says this is something practical that we can do to increase our faith and love. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, I urge then, first of all, prayers, uh, petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Now, most commentaries say, you know, petitions, prayers, and intercession are just three different descriptive words that tell us how to simply pray for the needs of other people. Now, the only reason, the only reason we would pray to God to meet the needs of other people is because we believe that God loves other people and wants to meet their needs, right? And so we ask God to express His love to other people. And when we do that, our love for other people is also increasing. It's automatic. And Paul says we should pray with thanksgiving to God. Now, why would you say thank you to someone? Well, we say thank you to someone because they give us a gift that we don't deserve, right? That's grace. So God always wants us to pray with gratitude in our hearts to him. He wants us to live moment by moment acknowledging his gracious love for us. And that includes our prayers for other people. You know, we might say, God, you constantly love me when I don't deserve it. And it's true, isn't it, for all of us? Thank you. I am so grateful. Now, Lord, I'm asking that you express your gracious love to these people too that I'm praying for by meeting their needs even when they don't deserve it. It's gracious love. The more grateful we are for God's gracious love, the easier it is to trust God and love people. Gratitude softens our hearts to God and to others. Gratitude increases our faith and our love. And then, if we want to increase our faith and love in prayer to an even higher level, <laughs> Paul says we need to pray for all people. Not just people we know and already love, right? 
It, it is easier to pray for people you already love than to pray for people you don't necessarily love or maybe even dislike. Now, that's a challenge, isn't it? But you know what Jesus said in Luke uh, 20, uh, 6, 27 to 28, famous verse, quite a challenge. It's, this is, I don't believe this can be done uh, by natural human strength. I think it requires a miracle of God. Here's what he said. He says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If we don't pray for people who mistreat us, we will begin to despise them. But none of us prays for our enemies by nature, like I said. But guess what? When we step out in faith and say, Lord, I'm going to pray for my enemies because I believe you love me when I don't deserve your love and that you love them when they don't deserve your love. Then that faith in God's gracious love begins to slowly but surely release the supernatural love of God in our hearts for them. And then in verse 2, Paul gives us some concrete examples of hard people to pray for. He says, pray for kings and those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Boy, <laughs> does Paul know how to push our buttons or what? Is there anything that frustrates most Christians more than our government? <laughs> Is there any group that we tend to grumble about more than our government? They are, they are either out to get us or they are so incredibly wasteful or they are just in politics for themselves and so on and so on and so on. Well, some of that's probably true. Most of them are mere human beings who are not experiencing the love of God, right? What do we expect? But Paul is trying to deliver us from the acid of bitterness in our lives. So he says, pray for your government. He knows the government is hard to pray for. But God loves people in our government too. And when we step out in faith to pray for them, look at this. He says we will then, we will then experience peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. He said we will um, become holy. <laughs> with the quiet peace of God's love when we constantly pray for our enemies. In this case, the government. I mean, it sounds strange, but it's reality, right? And maybe we need to pray this way for people who are even the closest to us. I mean, sometimes, let's face reality, sometimes we have feelings of anger and bitterness towards our spouse and our children. I'm sure you can identify with that. But when the Spirit in our lives is released in this kind of prayer for them, we experience supernatural peace. The fruit of the Spirit, as you know, is love, joy, peace. Praying for our enemies is the most effective and fastest way to be delivered from the misery of bitterness. Nobody wants to be bitter. Now, I used to believe that this verse was saying that we should pray for our government so that they would not, uh, you know, persecute us. And therefore we could then live outwardly peaceful and quiet lives without persecution. But no. The context is talking about our godliness, holiness, inner peace, and quietness, regardless of what the government does. For example, the next two verses make it very clear that we are not praying so that we can be saved from their persecution of us. No. We are praying that they can be saved from their selfishness and sin. We are praying that they may be saved through the loving sacrifice of Jesus for their sins just as we have. We, we are to pray for their salvation, not our salvation. Here's what he actually says as the verses go on in context. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. 
God deeply loves every single human being, and he sent his own son to die in our place on our behalf for our sins. Jesus is our representative or mediator between God and us. And anyone who humbly believes and accepts that loving sacrifice for them will be forgiven and saved. Now here's probably, I think, I think this is the most famous verse in the Bible. John 3, 16 to 17. For God so loved the world. The world that hated him, right? So God so loved the world that hated him that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, that's faith in God's love, right? Shall not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, no, but to save the world through him. So here is, uh, here's a summary of what we've talked about this morning. There is, I think, a natural tendency in all of our lives to drift away from the main goal of the Christian life. And that main goal of the Christian life is to increase our faith in God's gracious love for us, resulting in our increased gracious love for others. But how can we practically increase our faith in God's love for us that releases love for others? Well, Paul says, first of all, <laughs> it is to pray with gratitude to our gracious God for all people, even people we don't like. And that includes the government. And when we step out in faith and pray, God's gracious love is released in us, and we, this is great, we experience inner peace, quietness, and holiness. Is that something you'd like? I, I'd love that. Inner peace, quietness, Holy, my brain tends to go. Oh, to, to be just in quietness is wonderful. We are transformed inwardly when we say no to our hurt feelings of bitterness and step out in faith with God's love to others. And what is it that we are to primarily pray about? Well, we saw it. We are to pray for the greatest need that every human being has, and that is to be saved through the sacrifice of Jesus so that they too can experience the deep inner peace and love of God for eternity. And sometimes, we may even have to uh, pray for Christians, our fellow Christians, who have forgotten how much God loves them through the sacrifice of Jesus and have therefore lost their peace. Yes, sometimes we can lose our focus on what is the most important thing. And that, I believe, is the heart and core of the Christian life. That's the thing we need to focus on first of all. Well, let's pray as the worship team comes up again for a closing song. Father, we thank you for the message of um, your love. Thank you for bringing to our attention the, what is the main thing, the main goal, the main purpose of our lives it's easy to lose track of Lord and uh, so Father we thank you that you love us when we don't love you that's grace and we just want to drink it up all the time so that it might transform us soften our hearts and transform us inside and the way we treat others and so Father God I just simply ask that blessing to be an increased reality in each of our lives this week and in the coming weeks, months, and years to come, may we grow in faith and grow in love for each other. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Living with each 
each other It's sometimes hard to do Some people say good fences make a good neighbor God's not into fences That's why he made a bridge He said, love one another, pray for each other, forgive one another, as he's Encourage one another and give your life for each other, because he's the one who gave his life for us. Love one another. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. It's hard to do the same for each other. Fear gives way to perfect love. God is love and not God is love. He said love one another. Pray for each other. Forgive one another as he's forgiven us. Encourage one another and give your lives for each other. Cause he's the one who gave his life for us. Two can work together. Do a better job than one. If one falls down, his friends can help him on. One may lose the battle, but two can overcome. A cord of three strands is hard to break. He said, Love. Give one another as he's forgiven us. Encourage one another and give your lives for each other. Cause he's the one who gave his life for us. He said, Love one another. Pray. Give one another as he's forgiven us. Encourage one another and give your lives for each other. As he's the one who gave his life for us. Love one Well, today is the uh, first Sunday of the month, and uh, that's when we have communion. Um, I just want to mention, we do a communion. Uh, some of you may not have, uh, because it's the first time been here for maybe a year and a half, we've been doing communion with uh, just one element together with the bread on top and the juice on the bottom. And you have to you have to tear off the top to get to the bread, which is like looks like this. And then, you, uh, and then when it's time for the juice, you tear that off. So the, the servants, when they come to, uh, to hand out the communion, they'll just be doing it once and then uh, just so you're aware of that situation uh, but anyhow I would like to talk about the bread uh, what it represents briefly before we <clears throat> distribute it and um, the bread of course represents the broken 
body of Jesus Christ for us. And, um, you know, it reminds us that, you know, Jesus, it talks about the man, Christ Jesus, being our, inter, our inter, inter, intermediary between us and God. And that's very true. He became, God himself became a man so that he could take all our sin, all our sorrow, all our pain upon himself. And he did it in a very practical way. It, it, this happened, of course, primarily in the spiritual realm, but he wanted to make it sure that he wanted to make sure that, that we realized the extent of that pain. So he, um, you know, he was crucified. Maybe it was a different way that could have taken our sins, but he did it through the most painful way possible, crucifixion. And uh, so he did it for us. He went on the cross and took all our sin and pain on the cross, and he experienced the pain of that. And the thought that occurred to me is, you know, it shouldn't be, you know, that's not fair, is it? I mean, here God created us, and as human beings, we kind of strayed from him, went our own way, and rebelled against him, and infected by some selfishness and pride and all that kind of stuff, and his kingdom of love and peace has been destroyed, as it were. But he wanted to rescue us because he loves his enemies. That's what love is. God is love. So he decided to become a human being. And because he's God, he's sinless, and he was able to take all the sins of humanity from eternity past to eternity future and take it upon himself, all our pain. And he says, I'll pay the penalty of, of death in your place. I'll take it just so that you can be forgiven and be with me someday for eternity in purity. So, Jesus had said, do this in remembrance of me. We want to remember what an incredible sacrifice of love that God has made and the pain, physical, emotional, spiritual, that he experienced for us on the cross so that we could be set free and I'll just pray for the bread. And as I as I as I finish praying, perhaps the servants can come up and and uh, distribute the the communion cups. Father, we thank you for that wonderful sacrifice that you have made through your Son Jesus. Uh, that such love is beyond us. It's it seems unjust, and yet one of the reasons we don't love our enemies is because we don't think it's fair. They hurt us. Why should I pray for them? Well, because that's what you did for us, Lord. That's what supernatural love is. Help us to remember that, Lord, as we partake of the bread. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like a mighty mountain. Your justice flows like the ocean. And I will lift my voice, worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faith. Stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like a mighty mountain. And your justice flows like the ocean tide. I will lift my voice and worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. And 
I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness it's like a mighty mountain, and your justice flows like the ocean tide. Your righteousness is like a mighty mountain, and your justice flows like the ocean. Well, Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The juice, of course, represents the uh, blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross for our forgiveness uh, of sins. Uh, I think Hebrews said, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins, right? And uh, it's a reminder that he went through all this pain and took all our sins upon him so that he could pay the price and so that legally God would say, well, you don't have any judgment against you anymore. It's been received in Jesus and I'm going to look at you and treat you as if you are 100% righteous and pure now that's ultra forgiveness right that's ultra grace and that's the way he treats us don't deserve it but then if we deserved it it wouldn't be grace would it <laughs> that's what the juice represents forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord Let's pray. Father, we thank you now for the juice. And it represents blood. It represents the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins. And all we can say, Lord, is it's, it's amazing that you now look upon us as being forgiven people in Christ, dearly loved and accepted. And you don't treat us as our sins deserve. And so we want to remember that sacrifice, Lord. And, Lord, as we are accepting this, may we be willing to pass it on to others who do us wrong. May we give them grace as you give us grace. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich, let the blind say I can see, it's what the Lord has done in me. Let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich, let the blind say I can see, it's what the Lord has done in me. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna. To the river I will wade. There my sins are washed away. From the heavens mercy streams of the Savior's love for me. And I will rise from waters deep to the saving arms of God. 
I will sing salvation song. Jesus Christ has set me free. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Hosanna, Hosanna, to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. <clears throat> Paul said in the same way after supper, uh, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it again in remembrance of me. And Paul went on to say, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know what? That's the most important thing, isn't it? And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Scripture tells us that after Jesus and his apostles had met at, at the Passover in the upper room, said they sang a hymn and went out. And we do that traditionally here. We sing a hymn before we go. Uh, but we also want to remind people of one thing that we do in our church, and that is our Benevolent Fund. I think most of you are aware, but if you're not, a Benevolent Fund is a, is a, a financial fund that we maintain to help people in the community and in the church. It's not part of our budget. It's not something that goes for heats and or heat and lights and snow removal and that sort of thing. It's set aside specifically to help people who have financial needs or needs that finances can meet. And uh, we encourage people on Communion Sunday to remind themselves of the Benevolent Fund and to give to that fund when they think of it. Okay? Uh, so keep that in mind, and we're going to finish with this song. So... Press into the heart of the Father, hold fast to the grace received. Breathe in the life of the Spirit, with all faith believe. With all faith believe. Press into the heart of the Father, hold fast to the grace Breathe in the life of the Spirit with all faith believe. With all faith believe. Believe on this, the word of life. Christ has come to save us. Receive by faith his blood supply. Power of sin is cursed, and the Father is glorified. Believe on this, the word of life, our Lord the Christ has come to save us. Receive by faith his blood supply. Power of sin is cursed, and the Father is glorified. Press into the heart of the Father, hold fast to the grace we see. Breathe in the life of the Spirit, with all faith believe. With all faith believe. Amen. Well, don't rush off. 
For the first time in a year and a bit, we don't have to rush off. Stay around and visit. Stay around and uh, look at those strange faces you haven't seen for a while. And, uh, and uh, just enjoy each other for a while. If there's somebody here that you don't know, introduce yourself to them and welcome them. And uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us online. And uh, we pray that we see you all next week. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this. We thank you for this time together. This time that we share because of your great love. Your forgiveness. And the actions that, that you took to reconcile us to you. So that we could be family. We could be brothers and sisters with Jesus Christ and with each other. We would have you as our Father, and we'd have your Holy Spirit to dwell in us. God, that's just amazing. We just can't thank you enough for that. In your name, amen. <laughs>